So the commentary uh, by Chodra. Yeah. As long as one has not obtained all-knowingness, uh, omniscience, the veils of karma and affliction exist in one's continuum. Furthermore, various particular visual appearances that are formations may arise through physical condition of the four constitutions. Yeah, so what, what Chodra is doing here is that he is laying out um, kind of uh, these four conditions or four elements at play. When we, uh, uh, instead of relying on tr and trusting on, on the established conventions uh, of how the deities, uh, what deities are taught by the Buddha to meditate on and what not to, you know, instead of relying, as he says in this statement, on, on the deities, the Buddhas, as taught in the sutras and tantras as the principal ones, and there is during his time, the various people practicing, you could say unusual, maybe we say special or even, deities or buddhas that they say, oh, I got this in a vision, I got this in the... So he's saying, you know, like, hey, as long as you are not yet in all knowing, state of Buddha. Know that, you know, no matter how profound you think your meditation is or how trustworthy your dreams are, they are still uh, covered by the veils of karma and, and uh, kleshas. Then secondly, he says, you know, uh, these visual experiences, these visions and dreams can also arise due to our physical four elements uh, not um, functioning ordinarily. Uh, and when they are not functioning ordinarily, they can give rise to uh, certain temporary, but nonetheless uh, illusory um, experiences. Or they can give rise to like terrifying experiences as well. Such as when people talk about, you know, they're tripping you know, on some drugs or, you know, you, depending on the situation, you could see very exciting, inspiring things. You can also see very terrifying things. Right? So here he's not talking about tripping per se, but, you know, the mechanics is the same. He's saying your physical elements are out of whack, so you can have these things. So the, some of the famous stories is when Kampopa was training with Milarepa, and Kampopa was having, uh, among other experiences, I think he was also experiencing quote-unquote negative experiences. Then when he thought he was experiencing positive signs of visions, yeah. Uh, yeah one time I think he says, oh, I saw the thousand arm um, chinrizi. Oh, I saw the five Buddhist uh, empowerment deities appearing. To all of that, at least in the case of Kampopa, reporting those experiences to Milarepa, Milarepa says, Oh, you ate too much. Uh, and so then uh, indigestion. Uh, oh, you know, your meditation belt is uh, too tight. Uh, you need to loosen it. Uh, so, so these are the things that, that can give rise. And so, you know, how can we rely on these visions and dreams and say, okay, now I'm going to meditate. So back to the, the one about, uh, right, the, the teacher who has an experience of a hand coming down you know, says like these are not reliable. So the third reason he gives, even though visual experiences are a valid perceptions, since they are undetermined, if they are not reined in by profound dharmas, one does not know what to what they might lead. So he says yes, e even though. Uh, these uh, visual experiences uh, uh, are valid perceptions. So here is some technical uh, kind of technical terms being used. So 
Mm, it's valid perception as in it is said that the eyes, what the eye sees on, on some level, you can say is valid perception uh, because it's directly seeing something. However, not all valid perceptions uh, are um, Buddha. It's a valid perception. Uh, such as, you know, I think we don't use valid perception so much in our Dharma circles, uh, maybe in Galupa Dharma circles, uh, where they emphasize logic, you know, there's uh, valid perception. Maybe in our Dharma circles, you hear a lot of people talk about non-conceptual, non-conceptual. Yeah? And we think non-conceptual is automatically, we're talking about Buddha perception. Actually, no, it's like our, our five physical senses when they first perceive something, it's a non-conceptual perception. But those kinds of non-conceptual perception are, as he points out here in the case of um, this uh, valid perception, they are undetermined, they are neutral. Uh, so there's non-conceptual experiences that are neutral. And so here it says, you know, with regards to these neutral, if they are not reined in, if they are not uh, informed by the insights of the profound dharmas, then you don't know this so-called uh, valid perception or non-conceptual experience. Uh, you have no idea where it can lead. Yeah, so just because it's non-conceptual, just because it's direct valid perception, uh, it doesn't yet you know, guarantee that it will lead to uh, where you want to go. Four, Moreover, things that contradict the Buddha's instructions constitute false knowledge. So he says, you know, there are even cases where people say, oh, well, I, I had this vision, so it must be true. Yeah. So I think, again, whether we're talking about 12th century that, uh, or we're talking about now, mm, now in our context, I might say, yeah, you know, I personally, I do emphasize how we ne need to take responsibility for our own process, right? You've heard me saying that, right? You have to take responsibility for your own process as you apply the method. And you have to, uh, in a way you could say, honor uh, your own experience, but that cannot go in the direction of, oh, my experience, therefore it must be true. Because don't forget, right? The more basic premise is, our own experience right now is yeah, in a way not trustworthy from that particular perspective. But it has to be a kind of a middle way between not trustworthy, our own experiences in, in one sense, uh, in one context, but in another context, we do have to, right? Kind of pay attention to to our own experience, our own process. But how to pay experience, uh, how to uh, pay attention to our own experiences, our own process uh, in a skillful way. Not, oh, I had this vision, must be true. Oh, I have this dream, must be true. Yeah? And here it pertains to, yeah? again, you know, don't make up your own deities, in other words. And again, like in that discussion, I, uh, last time when we met, I said, you know, yeah, I do think, you know, like you can think of uh, Santa Claus like embodying Jambala principle. Yeah, you can think of, you know, uh, whatever kind of powerful spiritual religious symbols that especially that you grew up with or that you have become acquainted with. And you can think of them as expressing Buddha qualities. But that's very different from saying, okay, now here, I have a sadhana for you. Uh, let's meditate on this new deity that I had this vision of. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's what, you know, this is kind of, and of course, you know, this, this, this caution, uh, it doesn't, uh, this caution is, is to me applicable, not only uh, uh, in the extreme example, of like, okay, now let's meditate on a new deity. But it has implications on our attitude towards uh, the instructions that the Buddha has given uh, that has come down to us, right? 
Uh, now, to be fair, uh, I'm also, you know, I, I, my background is more as a historian, so I'm you know, trained to look for kind of historical evidence and all that. Then, to be fair, you know, I would say, well, you know, what's taught in the Tantras? Did Buddha Shakyamuni really teach, you know? Uh, in case you're wondering how I answered that question, I would say, literally, did Buddha Shakyamuni teach? I don't think so. I don't see evidence. Yeah? But here, concept of Buddha, principle of Buddha, yeah, is beyond. Right? Just Shakyamuni Buddha. Right? So in that way, we can say Buddha Shakyamuni. Yeah? Or Buddha, right? that which is taught by Buddha. So, uh, moreover, things that contradict the Buddha's instructions constitute false knowledge. Because of the vital points of these four reasons, whatever painting of deities and so forth there is, or whichever practice one does, one accepts exactly what Sutra and Tantra explain as the principal thing, but one does not accept that what is experienced and what is perceived in a dream as the principal thing. So here again, you know, this principal thing, I think, is one of the key uh, things to understand. And Chodra uh, and, of course, ultimately, Kyopa Rinpoche is not saying, you know, there's, there's no space whatsoever uh, for these visionary experiences and for these dream experiences, but they should not become the principal thing. Yeah, necessarily, I think... Uh, when we do generation stage practice, the details of the visualization will ultimately be based on our own perception, right? Our own perception of like, oh, jewels are jewels in this way, right? Silks are silks in that way, right? Uh, so crowns are crowns in this way or in that way, yeah? Uh, oh, I have a very, uh, I have a very like, uh, uh, that I cannot explain. I have a very clear experience the other day while meditating on uh, Avalokiteshvara. You might say that, you might have that experience where, you know, the the um, necklace that he wears, you know, you suddenly see the details so clearly. Now, it's not saying that you cannot now, right? Mm, next time you meditate on Avalokiteshvara, you remember that experience. It's not saying that you cannot do that. But don't make that again, like don't make your personal private experiences the principal thing. Yeah. Furthermore, if one's dream perception accords with the instructions of the Buddha, it is suitable for practice. Ah, so, you know, if it accords, you know, so, so our, so the bigger point being made here is our dream experiences, our visionary experiences, and our just, you know, experiences, we need to bring them into light. And what is the light? The light is the teachings. The teachings that we receive, the teachings that can be attested to uh, through reason. Uh, in, in other places, he, he talks about through reason, uh, through uh, references in sutra, yeah? through being taught by uh, a valid teacher. Uh, so these are some of the elements. Yeah? It's not just like, oh, well, it's in the text. In this, well, if it is in the text and if you don't know how to read the text, then it can also uh, be kind of off. Yeah? Or my teacher say so. So, well, your teacher say so. It's not enough in a way. Yeah? If what your teacher says, you know, contradicts what the text. It, so it's an interplay of these elements yeah? through reason, yeah? through uh, your teacher's instructions, through text. So, so there are these things that balance each other. Yeah? If there's one thing that you should know by now, you know, like Kyopas approach really emphasizes uh, as much as he talks about singular, right? Chikpa, gong chik, singular. It's not the exclusive singular, as in you only need to do one thing and everything is fine. 
but it's an inclusive singular, which is everything you do needs to be understood in terms of the fundamental nature. That then pro provides, therefore, uh, cohesiveness and non-contradictoriness to everything. And insofar as needing everything, yes, 84,000 is better than 83,000. 83,000 is better than 80,000. 80,000 is better than 8,000. 8,000 is better than 8. So vastly, uh, all the methods available to us, but uh, also seeing that they are all working together. Uh, they can all be harmonized together uh, into the singular holistic uh, approach. However, whatever does not accord with the Buddhist instructions is clearly false knowledge. Then the omniscient one knows the pure fundamental nature of all deities as it is and in its various instances. So as it is means, you know, the, the, the identity in all cases of these Buddha deities and in their various instances, in their specific manifestations. He has taught the means of practice as they are in order to benefit the beings. Yeah, so here again is important. He has taught the means of practice as they are, on the one hand. Meaning, these, these practices, these skillful means, right? These strategies, as I call them, right? These methods that he gives, first and foremost, they are based on the reality. Of things then then and only then also taking into consideration the particular situation of sentient beings so I think this point is a point that uh, uh, that again runs through the gong yeah? it's like there is the fundamental nature and if the teachings and the instructions and the skillful means and the methods cannot only be based on confusion, meaning accommodating the confusion of sentient beings and therefore taught to them, it cannot be that way. It first and foremost has to be based on an understanding of an unmistaken, clear understanding of the fundamental nature. And then only then, right given in words and expressions that can actually help beings so these two aspects is not so easy to achieve so often we think oh i want to be helpful but if in helping how we help is not based on huh, or very far from the fundamental nature, then we cannot really help. Well, we cannot really help. Uh, so in a way it's saying, you know, the main task for us right now is not to just like you know, be overtaken by our emotions of caring, compassion, and rush out uh, to help. But it needs to be to clear uh, our own obscurations uh, so that the more we can see the fundamental nature and understand this fundamental nature, then the more we will be capable of truly employing skill to benefit beings otherwise you know rule uh, fools you know rush forward <laughs> in trying to help and create a bigger mess In 
one of the <coughs> teachings of Gyopa Rinpoche, <coughs> recently uh, uh, working on that translation, uh, the translation team. Uh, <coughs> short teaching, but very interesting. In verses, this, this particular teaching begins with verses and then there's a prose section. So in verses, it says something very interesting. In verses, it begins by praising, uh, highlighting, praising one of the Mahasiddhas called Saraha. Saraha is, seems like one of the Mahasiddhas often quoted uh, by Kyoba Rinpoche. Mm. So here it hi he highlights Saraha. He says, Saraha, this great uh, Vajadara, uh, meaning Saraha is already Buddha, uh, so calling him Vajadara. Uh, Saraha, like this great Vajadara, it says, uh, mm, he was a great being that uh, taught clearly and unmistakably mm, the Buddha's uh, essence of Buddha's teachings, uh, and that Saraha, um, however, with regards to, it says, uh, to the heretics, uh, that's the word used, meaning uh, uh, those who do not follow yet uh, the Buddha's uh, teachings, uh, he says, but with regards to the heretics uh, uh, in his retinue, it said that he did not change or try to change their beliefs and their behavior. So it's very unusual, you know, to say that. Because you say, wait, isn't that Saraha's job, right? To change uh, in his retinue means his followers. So he says among his followers, Saraha did not <clears throat> change or less literally, but I think more closer to the meaning is, <clears throat> Saraha did not try to change right, their beliefs and their behavior. And you're like, wait, isn't that what you know a Buddhist teacher's job is supposed to be? Yes, yes, of course. But here it highlights how instead of focusing his efforts on changing you know, their beliefs and their behavior, he focused on realizing the non-dual nature between him, his own mind, and their minds. And he says, Gilbert uh, Rinpoche says, and therefore, uh, through training in Mahamudra in that way, uh, he brought about through change and through uh, true change and true benefit to so many beings. Uh, so interesting. In other words, it's saying, you know, actually, you debating people, you disputing with people, right? that's not really what's going to change them. <laughs> but you, you meditating and training more and more in understanding right? how you and others Others that we might, you know, see to be confused and pity them, you know, like, oh my gosh, how can they be so crazy? How can they be so uh, misguided? How can they be so wrong? Right? So objects of compassion. These are objects of compassion. So these days, you know, like uh, politically, especially because it's all constantly on the news, you know, those who disagree with you, these are the objects of your compassion. Right? Because if you think, oh, they're so misguided, they are so wrong that, you know. So according to, to Kyoba Rinpoche, he says, you know, what Saraha would do is, uh, and even among those who are close to him, who have those views, who have those ways of thinking, yeah, they are the objects of compassion. To be able to recognize the non-dual nature, whether with regards to the objects of compassion or the objects of uh, emulation, meaning Buddhas. So whether you're looking at Buddhas and are very inspired by their qualities, or you're looking at, you know, 
very deluded sentient beings uh, and forget about you know don't say anger but you know you you you've already gotten rid of the problem of anger against them you know uh, and now you have compassion towards them uh, whether you have compassion towards them uh, or you have admiration towards them uh, to be able to recognize that we are no different from them To be able to see how we share with all beings the samsara uh, that we all are trapped in uh, will allow more compassion and understanding uh, to enter the picture. To be able to see uh, how we share the same essence as all Buddhas, as all those who have been freed, uh, helps us not get stuck in suffering. Those two are important. Those two aspects are to be held together. Okay, this kind of what I sometimes call this creative tension between the two. The point is not to resolve it, you know, but that is how it is, uh, these two sides. And so anyway, coming back here. The omniscient one knows the pure fundamental nature of all deities as it is and in its various instances. Then he has taught the means of practice as they are in order to benefit the beings. Three, he has taught the impeding phenomena to be impeding. No one can challenge that saying it is not impeding. And four, moreover, concerning practicing what has been confirmed as practice, it is unacceptable to say that temporary and ultimate happiness do not arise. So the third reason is uh, he taught the impeding phenomena to be impeding. Uh, what it means there is like, you know, what are obstacles? What he has clearly uh, shown to be a hindrance uh, is a hindrance, uh, like uh, ill will. Wishing to harm someone yeah, is always a hindrance. Yeah, it's always an impeding phenomenon. Yeah, to try to say it is otherwise is yeah, to just delude yourself. Uh, more were concerning practicing what has been confirmed as practice. Yeah. Then, you know, and this is the opposite of that, as in you know, what the Buddha has has given as practice, yeah, then uh, you have to recognize uh, that they are helpful. Even if you personally right now uh, cannot figure out uh, or do not have the circumstances to experience how they are helpful, uh, it doesn't cancel out the fact that uh, Buddha has taught it as helpful. Due to these four reasons, too, the principal thing is just what the Buddha taught in Sutra and Tantra. Lord Maitreya says, As one endowed with eye sees by relying on a lamp, lightning, the sun, the moon, or a jewel, similarly, this is fully explained based on the sage, the sun that has the ability to eliminate the Dharma of great benefit. Yeah. So we need to have our own eyes, of course. Yeah. So that's the part about where I say, you need to be responsible for your own process. Uh, you need to be uh, honest with your own experience, your own uh, process, uh, and cannot pretend, you know, like, oh, I, I, uh, I don't have this. Uh, and try, uh, you cannot, like, you know, want to try so hard, right, to be a good Buddhist. Uh, then you're just, a lot of us, you know, like myself included, probably we're pretending, we, we're kind of thinking, oh, I'm, I'm good now, you know, I'm very stable, my mind, uh, my experiences, oh, I understand the Dharma, until something shocking happens, you know, then we're shaken. Yeah, Whatever that shocking news that you got, you know, that shakes you, you know, then uh, you'll see that your anxieties and all they are there, but this is not bad, this is just showing you okay, this is where I am, you know. So then, uh, let's see what I need to kind of change you know, in terms of my relationship with these teachings. So here is talking about, yeah, so first you need to be endowed with eyes, meaning your own eyes, you know, don't 
don't don't like uh, denigrate them right don't disrespect your eyes but your eyes alone will not allow you to see you also need to rely on a lamp lightning or the sun or the moon or jewel uh, which is the varying degrees of the buddha's instructions yeah? sometimes it's just like a lightning uh, meaning in the dark night you cannot see anything but suddenly there's lightning uh, then for just one moment you see so sometimes the dharma is just like that then sometimes the dharma is like a lamp uh, the lamp uh, its brightness can only allow right within a certain area and uh, not like the flash of lightning in the sky that illuminates the whole uh, area uh, a lamp right limited but more stable so that's another way that dharma can kind of illuminate than the sun and the moon uh, that's even more stable and more pervasive uh, or a jewel uh, jewel illuminous uh, can also allow so these are all like examples of how um, buddha's teachings can reach us sometimes like a lightning sometimes just like a little lamp uh, uh, but all those uh, are clarity and insight so interdependence of your well-functioning eye and illumination allows us to see clearly moreover by the same a scholar who is greater than the victorious one does not exist in this world the omniscient one knows everything and the supreme true reality others do not so here is basically saying you know yeah this 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 is here quoted especially you know sometimes in vajrayana the emphasis on like devotion to the guru can turn into like you know my guru is so great and yeah so great until even buddha's words uh, don't need to pay attention to <laughs> and kyopa would find this to be very uh, kind of uh, misguided uh, to think like that thus it is necessary to accept all deities and so forth just as taught by sutra and tantra this is the principal thing therefore someone might draw a deity of the tantras that is he might make a drawing or sculpture in accordance with the correct forms regarding proportions ornaments and so forth as is explained in the basic tantra such such as the agu samvara and the samvarodaya and so forth and so he says you know yeah in these tantras the basic form of the deities and everything is set forth and so if you were to paint you have to paint and you know draw them according to this then if that happens a person might explain the proportions and forms differently from that so 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 he says you know for instance you know someone might might say okay from the uh, samvarodaya and lagu samvara tantras these basic tantras describing in this case is chaka samvara's form yeah so then uh while this person is doing that uh, someone else uh, might might explain the proportions and forms differently from from these texts and say oh actually you know you should do it this way that way and expressing false knowledge and creating unacceptable fabrication saying this is better or more suitable than that Then Chodra says, you know, moreover, when someone draws the, so now, so, so he says, you know, there are cases where people say, uh, instead of basing themselves on the fundamental texts, uh, fundamental, like uh, you can say, source texts uh, for whatever practice, uh, there is often, uh, there's always a fundamental source text. He says, go back to that, follow that. Uh, as to someone else coming saying, well, that you know you should do this this that it says now be careful uh, or chodha uh, stronger not just be careful he says those are fabrications you know <laughs> now it, it, whether you want to follow chodha so literally or not you, know, you, you think about it yeah then he goes on to talk about how uh, in his time uh, people uh, the, chodha's time is 17th century yeah so then in his time how his painting people who paint gurus uh, try to depict the gurus 
this or that guru. Moreover, when someone draws the guru's body, if the guru's body shape is pleasant, he draws a likeness. And if it is not pleasant, he says, this is a statue of the guru's own intention, and it will increase devotion. So what it means here is, you know, uh, as what I understand, you know, although it's not crystal clear, what I understand is that he's saying, yeah, so there are people who draw the likeness of the guru to depict the guru uh, in, a, in a tanka. Uh, like, in other words, you know, create a portrait, right, of, of someone. He says, and if, if the gurus, you know, where, what you can see, you know, form and everything is is pleasant, you know, yeah, then then here the next next part is like if it is not pleasant, then uh, the people will say, no, no, we'll paint exactly how he looks yeah, to ordinary eyes. Chora says, no, don't do that. So this again, you know, makes us think about, you know, like photography yeah, of the guru yeah it also kind of explains why you know i have some reservations about you know putting big you know photos and, and he says oh this can inspire devotion yes i do accept i do recognize uh, how people feel about that but there are other points to be taken into consideration, of which the most important point, I think, is still, yeah, uh, like the anecdote, anecdote that I give, you know, of the interview uh, with one of the great translators of our times, you know, uh, where he asked this guru to be his guru and the guru pinched him, right, and said, the guru is not the body. So anyway, here it says, you know, such images, he, he, Chodha will use very strong words. He says, such images are nauseating. <laughs> he's like, <"Bleh." laughs> basically he's saying that, you know. Uh, he says, these pictures that, you know, depict the guru, you know, exactly as how they look. Yeah? He said, Bleh. <laughs> nauseating. The head and the body are disproportionate and one should not create them. Instead, it is necessary to create images where the guru is very beautiful, admirable, where the major and minor marks are automatically complete and where the characteristics such as the arrangement of the seat are complete and perfect. In this understanding, right, the individual quirks and oddities eh, of the individual is not what should be focused on because in, because again you know you're not following uh, the individual weirdness and quirkiness of the guru that's the wrong way of following the guru uh, following the guru means you know the guru's example is pointing you to uh, the qualities so again for me i'm i'm i don't feel that we need to be so literal. Okay, now I need to burn all these photos of gurus because they are not, you know, in the form of Buddha Shakyamuni, you know. But it is cautioning us and warning us, you know, not to forget, you know. So, yeah, obviously, you know, I have photos of His Holiness, of Kenshin Rinpoche, but be careful not to, like, look at that and then get stuck on the level of like the individual quirkiness. But to remember that the reason why we have these photos around is they are to point us in the direction of the Buddha qualities. That that's what we should admire. That's what we should develop. And that's, to me, that's the bigger point, the bigger take home point in these this couple of statements. Yeah. Where the major and minor marks are automatically complete, and where the characteristics such as the arrangements of the seat are complete and perfect. Yeah, in a way, you know, then artistically it's not very interesting. <laughs> 
but uh, uh, now you're talking about art. Are you creating an object of art or are you creating uh, a device, so to say, to be used to transform the mind? So fundamentally, tanka paintings, deity statues, they are not art, especially not art in the Western sense, which is like self-expression. It's not saying you can't do self-expression. Yeah, I'm sure you can, you know. <laughs> if, if that's what you need to do. But don't confuse that with uh, the more important points about how we follow, you know, how, not just Guru, how we train in deity training. You know, what is the meaning of right, taking divine pride? holding to divine pride what is the meaning of that just as we discussed you know it's not the pride that we're talking about likewise when we are devoted to guru it's not the ordinary devotion that people think devotion to the guru is Nowadays, some people attach very exalted names to an image. Huh? An image of a guru with a face like the muzzle of an animal. Huh? Who knows <laughs> what Chudra is referring to, you know. It's probably there were some people painting some guru in, with the muzzle of an animal. Huh? That was like, like trendy, you know, in his time. Huh? They might not have Facebook and memes and people are sharing so quickly uh, uh, but nonetheless give, even in his own context apparently uh, yeah it just makes you wonder like i wonder what that is an image of a guru with a face like the muzzle of an animal and to an image where the guru shows the soles of his hands and feet and sits on his behind like an old dog I might have seen actually Tanka paintings, old Tanka paintings uh, that, that Chodra is complaining about, yeah? which is basically uh, like, like that, you know, like the guru like holds out the two hands and holds out the two feet uh, and like in this crotch position like this. Yeah? Again, it was a, probably a trend. Where that trend comes from, right? It comes from uh, in 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 various texts, it says you know you should have like handprints and footprints of the Buddha because there's an earlier layer of Buddhist devotion where statues are not so common yet. Yeah, in fact, the earliest historical evidence of devotional practice. Uh, is like an empty throne that people would build, you know, just a basic platform uh, to symbolize the presence of the Buddha. Uh, then like the Dharma wheel, also a symbol. Then also footprints of the Buddha or handprints of the Buddha as symbols. So I think, you know, based on that, people thought, oh, handprints, footprints. So let's paint, uh, have the guru pose you know with two hands like that and and showing the two you know uh, soles of their feet like that and sitting like that so chodra is complaining about that yeah now whether kyopa will complain or not we don't know huh? but chodra definitely 17th century he finds this nauseating okay and then the other one with the muzzle of an animal I, i'm not sure what that i'm, I'm not seen uh, something like that in these old tankas. Huh? Then moreover, if the guru is a fully ordained monk, they draw the three drama ropes and so forth, not in line with our authentic texts, and hats, clothes, and so forth in various colors and shapes, such as black, white, and multicolored. So he's saying, you know, if the guru is a fully ordained monk, huh, then the three dharma robes has to be proper, and please don't change the color of the three dharma robes huh? because a fully ordained monk should not have multicolored robes. Huh? 
and certainly there are things like that painted. Uh, especially if the Lama, that particular guru, yeah, is well honored by like the king of China, like meaning the powerful king of a neighboring uh, 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 power. Uh, they, they like to give, you know, fancy paintings, fancy gifts to these lamas. Uh, and sometimes they are very uh, decorative. Uh, robes with brocade and, you know. And here Chodra is saying, if the guru is a fully ordained monk, please don't add all these things uh, to what he's wearing. Furthermore, they draw very wrathful forms of gurus sitting amid fire, wind, water, rock, clouds, trees, and so forth, and make up marvelous names and explanations. Yeah. So these days, you know, with uh, uh, all these uh, computer software, I see, you know, people, yeah, they, they, they take the picture of the guru, uh, of a particular guru, like, and then they you know, Photoshop it, he's riding now on a lion or a tiger, and then he's looking very wrathful, and people are like, oh, wow. Chota is like, ah, ah. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Since all this is only false knowledge, forced, shameless, and fabricated, contradicting the teachings of all Buddhas, why do knowledgeable ones rely on it? It is like the banana tree, devoid of essence and nothing else. <laughs> uh, personally, I won't go to such, you know, but uh, you, you decide, you know. <laughs> the point is, you know, he says, no, don't, don't do these things. <laughs> Again, we need to understand, okay, it's, we need to be careful. Why don't do these things, you know? We should not turn into Buddhist fundamentalists because the Buddha said no. But the bigger point of be careful. It's sort of like saying, this is to me a form of Buddhist critique of, uh, although normally you don't find it in Buddhist sources, uh, the Buddhist critique of the sin of idolatry. Yeah, in the Christian sense, the sin of idolatry uh, the superficial interpretation of the sin of idolatry is saying that it's a sin, right? As the, 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 the Abrahamic tradition will say, the sin of creating graven images of God, right? What is at stake there? The deeper, you know, like theologically, not just me making it up, but Christian theologians, the deeper issue of the sin of idolatry is to create is to mistake right a a creation to be the creator itself so it's the sin of like mistaken identity so in that sense we can use the expression to also express it here it's that we might mistake uh, this mundane form, mundane mind, mundane behavior uh, of gurus and of, of deities to be what we are supposed to emulate. And if we do that, then we run into problems. So much so, Again, I can appreciate, but I, I, I will, you know, I don't follow. Uh, there are some forms of Buddhism. Uh, there's one, one lineage, actually. I mean, it's a fairly new lineage in Korea called Won Buddhism, W-O-N. Maybe you have come across it. And they clearly have been influenced by like Protestant Christian influence. Uh, Korea has a strong Protestant Presbyterian uh, and Baptist uh, presence in uh, Korea. In Korean public life, uh, Christians are even more powerful than Buddhists. Uh, so there's a, a form of Buddhism called Won, W-O-N. And in their tradition, 
they don't use statues and paintings. Right? Instead, they have a calligraphy at most, right? which is like a, a brush stroke, right? like sort of like a Zen circle. Yeah? At most, uh, uh, they have that and say, that symbolizes the Buddha. So in part, it is, I feel, uh, they are worried that depicting Buddhas too much in like humanoid form, uh, human beings then get stuck on the level of like the individual kind of like quirkiness <laughs> or oddities uh, of the human rather than uh, those Buddha qualities. Likewise, in a less uh, stringent way, uh, I've heard like one uh, European uh, uh, guru, Lama, uh, has a large following, but he's a little controversial. <laughs> uh, some people really don't like him, say he's racist, uh, but regardless, uh, I'm pointing to more his, his kind of skill and understanding uh, uh, so that in Latin America, which he has quite a number of followers, he, he discourages his uh, followers in Latin America to, uh, to have like statues and tankas uh, in their Buddhist practice. Uh, because he says, you know, you guys are too stuck in uh, the Catholic culture of the cult of saints. So if you're not careful, you will just turn these Buddha images, uh, Buddha principles into uh, uh, your old religion. And so don't. Yeah. So he discourages the use of uh, statues and images. Uh, he says it's so easy for your old habits to kind of just latch on to these new symbols uh, and then uh, miss uh, using these symbols. So all of this, I think, is it, it's to call our attention uh, to this. Uh, one story I can tell. Uh, someone told me this story years ago. The story is about one of the great lamas of Jigong who has passed away. Zhuang Kunzhu Norbu Rinpoche. In photos, uh, you see he, he has this long uh, hair. <laughs> For 20 years at least, he was mostly in and out of retreat, mostly in retreat rather than out. So Zhuang has the style of keeping uh, a pile of hair, uh, although they're fully ordained monks. And again, people misunderstand, oh, maybe he's not a monk, he has hair. No, no, these are fully ordained monks, but because they are perpetually in retreat, so to say, so they have this hair. Anyway, I've told some stories about him before. Uh, he has a, an aspect of him that is kind of childlike. Huh? So very kind of uh, uh, unrestrained, huh? but not in the negative sense of the word unrestrained you know he's very childlike in a, in a sense you know? like his behavior <clears throat> hard to predict sometimes <clears throat> so another lama was telling like one time uh, uh, was traveling with Zhuang uh, Rinpoche to some holy sites in India <clears throat> and so um, Uh, and at these places, you know, uh, if you've been to Bodh Gaya, if you've been to, you know, Varanasi, Sarnath, you know, you know that around these uh, uh, sites, there are all these vendors, especially uh, young kids uh, and individuals just with a bag you know they don't even have a shop you know just with a bag then they pull out right these statues and uh, made from mud or made from plastic and they're like you know you know 10 rupees 10 rupees uh, you know of course they do not start with 10 rupees they're like 500 500 500 right uh, 
basically you can buy it for five. They'll start with 500 uh, because mm, foreigners will be like, oh, 450. They're like, okay. <laughs> I can get it for five. I tell you, I can tell you that. Uh, literally, I have done it before, you know. Five, they'll be very happy to sell it to you. <clears throat> anyway, mm. so Rinpoche was at one of these places and this guy comes over with like a plastic kind of Buddha, you know, like and said, you know, 1,000, 1,000, something like that, you know, and Rinpoche immediately, like, you know, pulled out money and gave, you know, and bought it. Then this, this Lama that was there, I was like, oh my God, you know, this is worth only five rupees. And I'm like, Rinpoche, don't, don't do that, you know. But then Rinpoche took that, you know, like plastic Buddha that's, you know, really not nice, you know. But Rinpoche took that and it's like, oh, Sanye Jodan, Sanye Jodan, Sanye Jodan. And he just stopped, you know, stopped everything, you know, and just spend you know, the time doing prayers, putting it on his head, putting it on his heart, and then putting it on everybody's head, and, you know, come, 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 you know. Blah, 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 blah. And this monk was like, Oh gosh, you know, Rinpoche just got swindled, you know, by this guy. But later this Lama understood, you know, Rinpoche's point is, you know, you are stuck on, this is plastic, this is not nice, this is cheap, that is the sin of idolatry. What Rinpoche sees is not that. <laughs> and what Rinpoche sees, even a thousand rupees, huh, is not enough to pay. What we see, in a way, even five rupees is too much to pay for. Because what we see is mixed up with our afflictive emotions, and afflictive emotions we should not give even one cent to buy. <laughs> right? So what Rinpoche saw when presented with this plastic Buddha is worth more than a thousand rupees. And if we bought that for five rupees, we have already paid way too much because what we bought was afflictive emotions. <clears throat> Likewise, there are instructions, you know. So here in this context, you know, Chodra is quite, you know, uh, not mincing words when he criticizes badly, right? Painted statues and images, right? But elsewhere, there are also instructions that say, you know, you never criticize a Buddha statue, a representation of Buddha that you see. Yeah? There are also instructions like that. Does it contradict what Chodra is saying here? No. Doesn't contradict the underlying point. It contradicts if you don't know how to put the two together. You say, well, over there it says, you know, don't criticize. Over here you use using such strong words. Well, on the meaning level, no contradiction. Why there are also teachings that says, no, you should never criticize. It's because if you criticize that statue, oh, that is this, this is that, this is this, this is that, right? Then again, that's the sin of idolatry. You don't understand that this, this created object that represents the Buddha's body, or Buddha's speech, or Buddha's mind, yeah, is pointing to something else. So whether you praise it or you criticize it, if what you're praising and what you're criticizing yeah, is the outer aspects and you forget yeah, what is being symbolized, yeah? so to, to, to get stuck on the symbol and miss what is being symbolized, then 
it's the quote unquote sin of idolatry. In those instructions, though, it says, you know, only one one context where you critique or criticize yeah, a statue or a re any representation of the Buddha's body, speech and mind is if you're doing it to improve it and to bring it more in line with uh, the established ways of representing, then that's okay. <laughs> then you are not, you know, you're not making that mistake and thinking, oh, Buddha is this. But rather, you're saying, in order to improve this. So in other words, I guess you could say, you know, constructive criticism is okay. <laughs> but if you just go around, oh, that, one's, uh, that statue is ugly. Oh, that statue is nice. Oh, that one is made of gold. Oh, that one is made of, you know, some rare wood. Oh, wow, wow. Then you're, you're treating these objects yeah, these supports, yeah, you're relating to them in the wrong way, not in accordance with Dharma. Dharma is not uh, following Dharma, right? Gampopa is for Dharmas. Dharma is not following Dharma. So after these two statements about, you know, uh, how we relate to these Buddha forms, especially Buddha forms, eh? deity forms, Buddha forms, idam forms, taught in Tantra especially. Eh? Buddha forms eh? uh, depicted in uh, non-Tantra is usually not controversial. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, you know. It's in the Tantras where you have unusual forms eh? uh, being uh, taught. There, the unusualness should not get us to spin off uh, in producing more and more unusual <laughs> and say oh this, this is for beings who need this oh this is for beings who need that yeah. so again that larger point is you know skillful means is only skillful yeah not because yeah, how well it can connect with the beings, but before that criterion, how much is it based on truth? How much is it based on the fundamental state? So I think that is an important point. So beyond the context of, you know, statues, images, deities, idams, right? When we deal with our day-to-day -day life, our problems, the challenges, other people. Before we go in the direction of skillful, meaning convenient, and sometimes skillful is what we mean is convenient. Before we go in the direction of convenient, before we go in the direction of, you know, don't create a scene, first we need to see first. Do we recognize uh, the fundamental nature aspect of what is going on? To whatever degree we have clarity of, of the nature of this experience, then to that degree we are able to then work with that experience to either transform ourselves or to transform others or mutually transform each other. The next couple of statements that we will do uh, moving forward has to do uh, with the ritual, uh, the issue of ritual, uh, which already uh, uh, a few statements back uh, was already discussing that. So then later it has the original state of the uh, Vajra body uh, and how those things are sometimes, you know, uh, the Buddha do not openly teach them and the reason behind that. And then uh, statement 13 is pointing out some of those things that are taught about the subtle body 
Uh, in the medical text, they have even more detailed information. Right, so the next three has to do with um, <coughs> excuse me, subtle body pertains to that. And again, a topic that some people get very, very excited about, especially people who like Vajrayana. They think this is this is the really profound stuff, you know, the movement of energy, manipulating energy, getting the winds to enter the central channel, and you all can experience this heat, this bliss, all these things, yeah? So the next three statements uh, is Gyopa clarifying uh, that matter. And then the famous line 14 of chapter 5, what is profound for others is not profound for us. What is not profound for others is profound for us. Uh, meaning what others consider to be, ah, that's just like, you know, Buddhism for dummies, uh, ABC. Uh, here, Kyopa says, that is truly profound uh, in our way of understanding. Uh, so that's uh, 14. Then 15 brings... Uh, 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 11, 12, 13 together with 14. 15 basically then says, therefore, with these two understandings, first, what is the meaning of all these subtle body, energy movement, blah, 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 these stuff. And then what is the meaning of what is truly profound? Then 15 brings these two together and says, you know, all those things about the subtle body movement of energy and all of that yeah uh, if they are not informed by the so-called non-profound teachings then all that subtle body stuff is not useful yeah? it's not useful can you repeat that please hmm? if can you yeah, repeat if that? All the winds, channels, drops, all that subtle body, energy movement, blah, 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 is not informed by the so called non profound. Then they are not useful. They're useless. They're meaningless. Okay. That's 15. We'll, we'll look at this in detail. Uh, 16, 17. Yeah, we're getting close to, <laughs> closer and closer to finishing this chapter. So anyway, we will stop here today. Dr. Lai. Yes. Uh, I just happen to know the uh, reference to the banana tree being devoid of essence. Yeah, banana tree has no uh, essence. That's a common uh, uh, expression found in Buddhist text. You strip banana tree, you know, it's just like an onion, layer, 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 there's nothing in there. That's all it's saying. Sometimes uh, also called a banana tree is to say, Whereas the virtues uh, of bodhicitta uh, is, con is, is continuous, uninterrupted, all other virtues are like the virtues of a banana tree, uh, that expression also given. Uh, what does that mean? Of course, it's meaningful to people who banana trees grow you know, in their yard so they understand <laughs> what that means to those of us who don't know what bana how banana trees grow uh, uh, then we're like what what that's talking about is uh, uh, every trunk of banana by the way technically a banana is not a, a tree a banana is we have determined i looked into it right it's an herb uh, definition of the herb is uh, the uh, herbaceous <laughs> It's, it's the way that so anyway mm, we call it the banana plant then you know every trunk of a banana plant uh, will only fruit once now, once it has fruited and you have harvested the fruit you have to cut off the trunk because it doesn't 
it doesn't bear more fruit. Uh, so that is another example used about banana, it says, you know. Whereas the virtue, the power of bodhicitta, uh, the, keeps bearing fruit. In other words, like most other fruit trees, uh, acts of virtue not motivated by bodhicitta will only bear fruit once and then they die, like a banana plant. So that's what banana is about. Oh, it's snowing outside. Chanju sem churim purche Magye panam kye gyurche Kye panyam parme bhaya Bone gomdu It's a reminder, we do not meet uh, Wednesday morning. And for those of you who are involved in the Dugong Dhamma Kirti, uh, then we will meet uh, Wednesday night. Okay. Well, in Western Hemisphere, Wednesday night. In Asia, Thursday morning. So, okay, Tata. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. So generally, Monday mornings we do Guru Puja, generally. <laughs>